Thank you, everyone. It's good to join you this evening, and I'm honored uh, to uh, be the first uh, speaker in this series and honored uh, with the chair, the St. Tom Thomas More chair. Tom is right that the main difference between the first time I was attorney general and the second time is that people actually recognize me this, this time around <laughs> after leaving office. And First time I went into airports, I wore a mask, and I took off my glasses, hoping that the combination of actions would, you know, help me sneak by without people recognizing. It must be something about me, but people still recognize me. I went into the men's room at Chicago O'Hare Airport, and this guy was at the sink washing up, and he looked around, and he said, did anyone ever tell you you looked like uh, Bill Barr? <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, I hear it all the time. <laughs> He said, well, you had me until you spoke, because your, your voice is nothing like Bill Barr's. I said, yeah, okay, well, you're, you're on to me there, so. Um, in my speech at Notre Dame, uh, I explained that our, our founders uh, considered free and robust, a free and robust religious sphere as an essential precondition for a system of broad personal liberties and limited government. They were practical statesmen who uh, understood that society can exist, can't exist, unless there's some means of constraining the tendency of individuals to prey on others. And in the framers view, there are two separate sources of control. Uh, capable of restraining men's appetites and passions. One is within each individual. It's the virtue in each person's soul, their moral compass, their ability to, uh, to control themselves. The other source of control is the external coercive power of the state. And the framers believe that the more society has of one, the less it can do without the other. And because they believed the American people were religious and virtuous people, and that there was a strong religious sphere in the United States, they believed that these people had the self-control necessary to enjoy limited government and the broad personal liberties that that entails. Now my basic theme today is that it's not religion that is intruding into the government's rightful arena. It is the government these days that is usurping the role of religion. In general, in the classical world, before the emergence of Christianity, there was no separation of the realm of religion and moral education from the realm of the political and civic. The religious and moral education function were largely subsumed within the political life of the polis in ancient Greece. It was the state that instructed men on the purpose of life and what it meant to live a good life. The state was thus a positive moral agency. Its role was not just restraining the bad, but leading men to the good. Indeed, it was only through participation in the state's political life that men achieved their highest moral purpose in the Greeks' way of thinking. Christianity forced a bifurcation of authority over men's lives. And this fateful division became the mainspring behind expanding personal freedom. The idea that there are two separate powers over men corresponding to two separate sets of duties goes back at least to Christ's injunction Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. 
this duality was enlarged upon in Christianity by St. Augustine's conception of two coexisting realms, one transcendent and spiritual, the city of God, the other temporal, the city of man. And we see this same duality played out throughout the Middle Ages with the concept of the two keys, one temporal and one sacerdotal. This conception eventually led to the separation of church and state. Now today we are apt, because of conventional wisdom, today we're apt to think of this idea of separation, or at least the secularists like to think of it, as though it's in, as, as a, to, to connote that ostracism, to connote the ostracism of religion from worldly affairs, the relegation of religion to the cloisters, getting them out of the public square. But that's not what separation between church and state meant at all. The idea was a division of labor and the autonomy of each authority within its respective sphere. And religion's rightful sphere of, of, uh, sphere of labor was not confined to otherworldly matters. On the contrary, its function was to make people virtuous in the world, in the here and now, and capable of controlling their passions. James Madison famously observed that if men were angels, there'd be no need for government. In simple terms, it is the role of religion, not the state, to make men more like angels. And it is the role of the state to deal with the external acts of men when they behave more like devils. Under our system, unlike the Greek polis, it is not the role of government to define the good and lead men to it. It is not the role of government to shape men in its own image. The state's role is essentially narrowed to a more backup function, restraining the wicked when individuals' moral disciplines fail. The crisis in the West today is that having based our ideas of liberal limited government on a religious sphere capable of instilling in citizens the capacity for self-control, the realm of religion and its power over people is crumbling. The crisis is pervasive and deep. Human beings have a long rap sheet when it comes to apostasy. That's really the theme of the Old Testament. Reconciliation with the Creator and then falling away once again. And today, the signal feature of our age is man's abandonment of God. We are going through a revolution. It started gradually in the 18th century with a steady erosion of the Judeo-Christian foundation of Western civilization. And like all revolutions, it has accelerated until today, we see all around us the stunning collapse of the Christian worldview and a culture that has been based, and the culture that's been based on that worldview. And it is being supplanted by a wholly alien belief system, one that is secular, materialist and solipsistic. Even though I still have a book in, on the market, I'd like to recommend another book to everybody. <laughs> Carl Truman, who is a professor at Grove City College, has a recent book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And I urge you all to read it because it really explains what has been happening since the end of the uh, 19th century, really starting in the 19th century, and how the sexual revolution is really well, perhaps the most sensational and obvious fruit of that revolution. It's really just a manifestation of a deeper change in the way people think and our culture. 
Today we live in a culture that sees the meaning and purpose of life as revolving solely around the individual's internal feelings, the individual's interior sense of well-being, pleasure, and satisfaction. And under this ascendant worldview, man has no ultimate purpose, no purpose or end outside himself. This is an outlook that is antithetical and subversive of the Christian worldview. As far as we can tell, religion has been integral to human life at least since Cro-Magnon man first emerged. And indeed, there are signs now that Neanderthal man had a religious life. Western society today is man's first sustained experiment at living without God. The first attempt to build a civilization on a godless and materialist foundation. As more people adopt a purely secular outlook, they tend to turn to the government to perform those functions of moral education and moral discipline that had been the domain of religion. Thus, the dynamic today is not that religion is invading the space of the secular state. It is that the secular state is being called upon to invade the space that had been reserved to religion. The problem today is not the threat of religious people establishing a theocracy. It is the reality that secularists are trying to establish an atheocracy. This evening, I want to talk about focus particularly on one facet of this conflict, the role played by education, and how the crisis of secularization is playing out in that arena. Human beings are unique mammals in that we do not, we do not uh, come into the world with many instincts. Instead, we rely on the transmission of ideas and information and skills that allow us to survive and thrive both as individuals and as members of a group. And for this reason, humans have a long period of immature dependency, much longer than any mammal, other mammal, during which that transmission of ideas and information is supposed to occur. Education is the process by which we transmit to the next generation our accumulated technical and moral knowledge and our cultural inheritance. Critically, education is not just about technical skills. It's not just about vocational training. It's not just about the three R's. At the end of the day, education is necessarily also about moral formation conveying to our children what is it to live a good life. And this task requires helping children learn the truth about themselves and how they fit into the universe they see about them. And therefore, education necessarily addresses the big questions. Why are we here? Is there a purpose to life? How do we live a good life? What are our duties, and where do those duties come from? This is education. And who has the primary responsibility for providing and framing that education? As a matter of natural law, it is obviously the parents who love the child unconditionally and want only what is best for the child. Now, parents can turn to various private and public entities to provide certain technical lo logic and help. But on matters of character formation and moral education, parents must have the final say. I think the Supreme Court has recognized that parents have a fundamental right to guide the education of their children. And I think this is a separate right from a purely religious right. It has to do with the very nature of human beings and their children. But it also is integrally related to religious right, because clearly at the heart of the free exercise clause is the right to raise one's own children in the faith. And it would be a monstrous invasion of religious liberty 
for the state to interfere with that process. The central point is that up until the 19th century in the West, education and religion were regarded as inseparable and the educational project was inherently bound up with religion and moral instruction and for that reason was viewed as falling within the religious sphere and the parental sphere, not the states. And for most of the West, education was in fact carried out by parents and for those fortunate enough, the church. The state really didn't get into the act in a significant way in the West until the mid-19th century. In 1830s, we witnessed a movement to make education broadly available to all children at public expense. And this, this was a good idea. This was a noble idea, universal education. But it resulted in a decision to provide this education exclusively through state institutions staffed by public employees. This shift of the educational function from the moral religious sphere over to the state sphere raised a fundamental question. Would the state schools provide an education that continued to involve a moral dimension? And if so, what would the basis for those moral values taught, what would it be, if not religion? The conundrum for public schools is that they are constitutionally required to be religiously neutral. Public institutions, public bricks and mortar, public employees. But is it possible for education to be religiously neutral, unless it is skinnied down to subjects like the three R's, or fact-based courses like history and science, and purely technical knowledge. Once a school goes beyond this and attempts to espouse and inculcate moral values, theories, or ideologies, two basic problems arise. First, where does the state get the power to mandate indoctrination of children in a moral system or any ism or any ideology. And second, when a school promotes moral values incompatible with traditional religious beliefs of its students and their families, and the only way to avoid the teaching of those subversive values is to pay for a private school, does this not burden the free exercise of religion in violation of the Constitution? The fact is that any education seeking to play a role in the moral formation of students will inevitably bump up against religious belief. Personal and civic moral, uh, moral systems don't just hover in the air. They must rest on an explanatory belief system, a metaphysical foundation. When I was little and my parents told me to do something or to refrain from doing something, I would ask why, and they would generally say, because we said so. Now that might work for children, but it doesn't work for adults and society at large over the long haul. It is hard to tell people that they ought to behave in a certain way unless you explain why. Any system of morality rests on a set of beliefs that explains why it is necessary to be good at all and why being good requires performing certain duties and refraining from performing, uh, engaging in other kinds of conduct. Thus, to the extent education works or seeks to contribute to the student's moral formation, it will inevitably get into the arena of religious belief. How have American public schools handled this inherent conflict? Essentially, we've gone through three phases. In the first phase, the problem was ignored. For over a century, 
up until 1960, from roughly 1830 to 1960. The public school system was not religiously neutral, and it did not pretend to be. When it emerged, the public school movement's explicit mission was the moral formation of American youth. And public school advocates like Horace Mann explicitly agreed that religion had to be an integral part of education. The strategy was to incorporate Christianity as unobtrusively as possible in the curricula. The religious worldview incorporated into public schools for almost a century was an anodyne version of general American Protestantism composed of the beliefs that Protestant denominations generally agreed on. The Bible was read in school, prayers were said, the, and, and, and the King James uh, version of the Bible was read regularly. Public schools muddled through with this arrangement because virtually all Americans during this era were attached to Christianity. As late as 1960, 95% of the American people self-identified as Christians and accepted the Judeo-Christian foundation of our moral system. This approach started falling apart, however, after 1960. The Supreme Court started articulating and more strictly enforcing the requirement of religious neutrality. And just as importantly, the American people were becoming more diverse in their religion, religious views. There was less consensus over the content of morals and norms. The second phase of public education was the initial response to this fracturing of religious belief. It started in the late 60s and continued roughly to the midpoint of the Obama administration. And during this period, the left embarked on a relentless campaign of secularization intent on driving every vestige of traditional religion from the public square and specifically from public schools. This benighted effort to make schools truly neutral was superintended by the Supreme Court with a hyper-aggressive campaign to expunge any trace of religion, especially Christianity, from inside the schools. The objective was total secularization by stripping away religion. It was secularization by subtraction. But expunging religion does not result in religious neutrality. Instead, the net effect was to elevate the most aggressively secular viewpoints while suppressing any religious viewpoints. Yet even as schools were forcibly secularized, the reformers wanted to retain the school, schools as agencies of moral instruction. But while they wanted to teach morals, they were busily tearing down the foundations that had sustained the moral system to that point. The rich Judeo-Christian tradition was replaced with sort of mawkish talk of liberal values, be a good person, and so forth, be caring of others. But there was no underpinning for those values. What passed for morality was no, had no metaphysical foundation. Values in public schools were really nothing more than sentimentality, still drawing on the vapor trails of Christianity. The third phase, the one we see about us today, started during the Obama administration and has grown apace with the ascendance of the militant secular progressive movement. <clears throat> the objective is no longer to secularize by subtraction. Now we are uh, seeing a mounting effort to affirmatively indoctrinate children with secular progressive beliefs, a new official secular ideology. In other words, having created a void by removing the religious foundation upon which our moral values have been based, Progressives are trying to inculcate an, 
an alternative explanatory belief system. But secular values are not religiously neutral values. On the contrary, today's progressive secular ideology is premised on ideas about the nature of man, the universe, man's duties and the purpose of life that are a substitute for and subversive of the religious outlook, especially traditional Judeo-Christian worldview. Putting aside its impact on, on religious freedom, what is the state's authority in the first place to compel people to submit to indoctrination on transgenderism or, or, or critical race theory or socialism or any ideology? The state has a legitimate interest in requiring people to take courses in reading and writing and arithmetic and science and history and safety and hygiene and civics and perhaps a host of other subjects. But I doubt the state has untrammeled power to compel people to submit to indoctrination into particular ideologies, whether it be transgenderism, CRT, or anything else. States don't have authority. Under our system, the government does not have authority to make people think the way it wants them to think. Can it really be <clears throat> that a state, by collective vote, gets to decide what are the desi desirable moral values that must be inculcated in every child and then indoctrinate in those values regardless of the parents' desires. When I was watching the debate over the, the recent Florida law, which is uh, talk about disinformation, by calling it don't say gay is you know, sort of the ultimate disinformation. It's a very modest proposal to defer sensitive sexual discussion with little children until they're of you know, above the third grade. I think that was around the time I learned about the birds and the bees, and that was pretty normal stuff, the kind of birds and bees I learned about. But uh, even then, we understood that you sometimes, some information you defer until the child is more mature. But as I listened to that debate, uh, it seemed, I was reminded of Sparta because you see these educational bureaucrats acting like they have the right to determine what is best to teach the child and that the parents essentially surrender the child to the state. Now they put it again, disinformation. They talk about the, the child doesn't, is not the property of the parents. Well, no one has suggested that a child is the property of the parents. The parent-child relation is sui generis. It's based on love and a duty. And uh, the idea that in our country, we surrender the child to the state for the state to determine how that child is educated is outrageous. I mean, <clears throat> just decades ago, Anyone who said that our Constitution accommodated the Spartan system where at seven years old, boys were turned over to the state to be raised regardless of what the parents wanted and thought that that was something that we could actually have in the United States, people would have thought you were crazy. But the way these bureaucrats talk, they believe they have the right. You can compel kids to go to school. Don't forget it's coerced and then they get to decide, not the parents, what is taught. When public schools were emerging, this basic question was raised by many religious people. And I was particularly attracted to the comments of one 19th century Midwestern newspaper editor, a Roman Catholic named Humphreys Desmond. And his remarks on the curriculum in public schools I thought were very prescient. And this was in the middle of the, 18th, uh, the 19th century. 
excoriating efforts by public educators to create ad hoc, as he referred to it, religion of a ad hoc religion of humanity in public schools. Desmond exclaimed, a coterie of principals, superintendents, and institute exhorters get together and coolly proceed to construct a public school credo. They seem to take it for granted that they have the power to usurp apostolic and constitutional prerogative at one fell stroke. They establish their species of state religion and imagine that they can ram it down the throats of people professing other or contrary creeds. He pointed to the conflicts that had just, were just then arising in Europe with the advent of public education, which paralleled our own broadening of education. There the question had become, he said, whether, quote, the state can construct a scheme of ethics and force it upon the children of religious parents. The atheocracy has seized the school system for an anti-Christian propaganda. Nothing of the, and he's talking about Europe, nothing of the kind must ever be permitted to occur in America. Unfortunately, that is exactly what happened. And the history in Europe <clears throat> was when they tried to secularize education, even in a heavily secular country like France, in places like France and Belgium, there was pushback. And they ultimately were driven to permit and pay for religious schools. So that in Europe, England, where we fled in order to get religious liberty, we f I mean, our forefathers fled England for religious liberty. And yet in England, <clears throat> you can go to a religious school paid for by the state, whether it be Catholic, Church of England, Hindu, Muslim. And the same is true in one of the most secular countries in the world, France. But here, we, ha we have a public school system that's mandatory and which, like its European uh, school, like the European schools, has become increasingly secular. The difference here is that for parents to escape it, they have to pay through the nose. At a minimum, the kind of indoctrination that is occurring these days in public schools plainly implicates the free exercise clause of our Constitution. When the state gets into the business of indoctrinating students into secular belief systems that are contrary to religious beliefs of students and their families, and we're not talking about esoteric religions like, you know, thuggy or something like that. We're talking about the religions that gave birth to our civilization. But when it starts indoctrinating children with beliefs that are contrary and subversive of those traditional religious beliefs, it's clearly burdening the free exercise of religion, as well as the parental rights to guide the religious upbringing and the education of their children. Thus, a state that proposes to teach a child that he gets to choose his gender and no one else has anything to say about it is, it, it is teaching an ideological dogma that is plainly contrary to science. It's not scientific that there are more than two genders. And it is clearly contrary to traditional Christian beliefs. And by teaching that kind of thing, it is clearly violating the free exercise clause of the Constitution. While the free exercise violations resulting from indoctrination are clear enough, I think things have also reached a point where states may be running afoul of the establishment clause. When we are no longer <clears throat> talking about simply stripping religion out of school curriculum, but now the affirmative teaching of a value system, resting on materialist metaphysics 
and taking the place of a religion, then this raises the question whether this indoctrination is the establishment of a religion. Instead, indeed, the Supreme Court foresaw the potential that secularism itself could be established as a state religion. In one of its first cases abolishing school prayer, the Supreme Court acknowledged that the state may not establish a religion of secularism in the sense of affirmatively opposing or showing hostility to religion, thus preferring those who believe in no religion over those who do believe. We have to consider <clears throat> whether things have reached a state in our public schools, whether we are seeing precisely that establishment. In my view, the increasing diversity of attitudes and beliefs among Americans in the past few decades, the diversity we see in our country, makes the state's continued insistence on a monopoly over publicly funded education con constitutionally untenable. This arrangement can no longer be finesse. We can no longer finesse the constitutional problems with this arrangement, as we did when everybody, virtually everybody, adhere to the Christian religion. Nor is it capable of producing genuine religious neutrality. The point is that we sh should not, I'm not saying we should mandate Christianity in the state's one-size-fits-all educational monopoly. It is that the diversity of religious belief should lead us to jettison the monopoly. The rise of militant secularism in the United States forces upon us a fundamental question about the way our society is now providing public education. One of the main purposes of public education was to broaden its availability by providing public funding for citizens up to a certain level of schooling. But public funding does not require that the education be provided by means of government organizations. The alternative is obviously to have public funds travel with each student, allowing the student and parent to choose the school, private, public, non-sectarian or sectarian, that meets their needs. The state's interest in assuring that a certain level of basic skills are taught can be met by accreditation standards but the government's ability to dictate the content of curriculum beyond this would be severely curtailed. Well, there are likely to be skirmishes over accreditation standards, instances of government overreach in this world, the world of vouchers, would be far more transparent. This would not only be the most efficient way of providing publicly funded education, because, as you know, we are paying through the nose for our public education system, and we're getting no return, very little return in most parts of the country. <clears throat> we spend more than 15000 per student in this country. On the average, some states as much as 30000 per student. And yet, when we look at the, the, the achievement levels of American students compared to the rest of the world, it is shameful. We're far down on the list of advanced countries in reading, in science, and in math. Uh, below average in, in almost every category. Now, we don't have all the information on China, but we do have some of their cities' information, such as Shanghai. And they're number one, by far and away. They're number one in reading, they're number one in math, they're number one in science far in advance of the Western democracies. <clears throat> so just in performing their basic function, before we get into moral formation, they're failing. And our future is being stolen. Our technological prowess, which provides our security and provides our prosperity and provides opportunities for generation after generation since the late 1800s, is being stolen from us. And the key, the key technologies of the future, 
Congress, uh, China set up a, a program, China 2025, where they want to dominate every single one of those technologies, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, 5G, and they're doing it. The fact that they launched a uh, hypersonic missile before us was stunning that they would be able to accomplish that. So when I say that vouchers would be a more efficient way of spending the money, the data is there to show it. The charter schools, the Catholic schools are doing a far better job of not only of allowing a diversity of thought and, and, and education that is compatible with parental values, but also in the basics of teaching. An inner city kid goes to a Catholic parochial school, their chances of graduating are far higher than if they go to a public school and their chances of getting into college and staying in college are far higher by an embarrassing amount. So it's an efficient way of getting the kind of educational results that we want. The other thing, <clears throat> unfortunately my, my phone is going off here, but I'm just going um, The other thing is that one of the, the main justifications for public schools was that they would be institutions that would promote our common identity and solidarity based on all being American. They'd, be, they'd help the melting pot idea of our country. But when we look around today, especially at the effectively segregated and failing inner city schools, I don't think we can say that public school system has any unique virtue in facilitating America's melting pot. And indeed, parochial schools are an example of a non-exclusive school system that has been extremely successful in integrating wave after wave of new immigrant into American society. And indeed, it's curious to suggest that the public school system somehow performs a function of assisting our melting pot when we see a curriculum now being adopted that does just the opposite. Their curriculum is undermining national cohesion. Public schools are adopting courses designed for the opposite mission of separating us, of teaching that we have unbridgeable differences, uh, of dividing us into many different identities destined to be antagonistic. And it's all the more alarming and bizarre <clears throat> that the new state-sanctioned ideology challenges the very legitimacy of the nation itself to the point of explicitly attacking its founding documents, its principles and symbols. If the state-operated schools are now waging a war on the nation's moral, historical, philosophical, and religious foundations, then it would seem they forfeited their legitimacy as a proper vehicle to carry out the mission of bringing us together, the mission that the American people have charged them with. Time has come to admit that the approach of giving militantly a militantly secular government-run school a monopoly over publicly funded education has become a disaster. It has deformed and impoverished the very nature of the educational enterprise, first by purging it of any moral or spiritual dimension, and then by trying to substitute for traditional religion, an irreconcilable rival value system. Parents wishing to opt out from the government's secular madrasas are subject to harsh penalty in the form of private school tuition that most cannot afford. As a result, our public schools have inevitably become cockpits for a vicious winner-take-all culture war over the moral formation of our children. When I got, I was, early, early, when was it? It was on Monday, I spoke at the Reagan Library out in California. And I got back, and last night, opening up the mail, 
And I got this letter from a, a fellow in a town in Virginia who I didn't know, but it's a long letter that says a lot of nice things about me. <laughs> but his last paragraph I thought was, especially because I knew I would be speaking tonight here, um, was apropos. He, he said, I've seen your remarks on the takeover of education by progressive secularists, and I'd like to offer two quick pieces of advice. First, your message is absolutely spot on. Please, retired or not, keep pounding that message to every organization and in front of any talking head that will have you. Pound it until the media begins to accuse you of seeking political office. <laughs> to me, the issue of education and the attacks on the freedom of religious conscience are the root cause of every social problem we can't solve in our nation today. The forceful momentum of secular education needs to be blunted, if not outright reversed. Second, when you die and stand before judgment, I think you're going to want to argue. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> so, it's easy when we see everything going to hell in a handbasket, you know, to get overwhelmed by the, the, the degeneration uh, of our culture and the breathtaking, mind-boggling advances that are being made by the forces of, being made by the forces of uh, progressive secularism. And I don't think fixing our school system or even permitting a diversity of schooling in our country through vouchers is a panacea that's going to immediately stop the general cultural rot. But as Christians, instead of standing around complaining and moralizing about what we see, we should try to do something about it. And I do think that while it is not a cure-all. It is an essential first step to getting our country and ultimately perhaps Western civilization back on the path of sanity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.